The Butterfly Lion by Michael Morpogo. This is read in, with permission of HarperCollins and Collins Children's Publishing. Chapter 1 is called Chill Blains and Semolina Pudding. Butterflies live only short lives. They flower and flutter for just a few glorious weeks and then they die. To see them, you have to be in the right place at the right time. And that's how it was when I saw the butterfly line. I happened to be in just the right place at just the right time. I didn't dream him. I didn't dream any of it. I saw him, blue and shimmering in the sun, one afternoon in June when I was young. A long time ago. But I don't forget. I mustn't forget. I promised them I wouldn't. I was ten and away at boarding school in deepest Wiltshire. I was far from home and I didn't want to be. It was a diet of Latin and stew and rugby and detentions and cross-country runs and chillblains and marks and squeaky beds and semolina pudding. And then there was Basher Beaumont who terrorised and tormented me so that I lived every waking moment of my life in dread of him. I had often thought of running away but only once ever plucked up the courage to do so. I was homesick after a letter from my mother. Basher Beaumont had cornered me in the bathroom and smeared black shoe polish in my hair. I'd done badly in a spelling test, and Mr Carter had stood me in the corner with a book on my head all through the lesson, his favourite torture. I was more miserable than I'd ever been before. I picked at the plaster in the wall and determined there and then that I would run away. I took off next Saturday afternoon. With any luck, I wouldn't be missed till supper, and by that time I'd be home, home and free. I climbed the fence at the bottom of the school park, behind the trees where I couldn't be seen. Then I ran for it. I ran as if bloodhounds were after me, not stopping till I was through Innocent's Breach and out onto the road beyond. I had my escape all planned. I would walk to the station, it was only five miles or so, catch the train to London. Then I'd take the underground home. I'd just walk in and tell them that I was never, ever going back. There wasn't much traffic, but all the same, I turned up the collar of my raincoat so that no one would catch a glimpse of my uniform. It was beginning to rain now, those heavy, hard drops that mean there's more of the same on the way. I crossed the road and ran along the wide grass verge under the shelter of the trees. Beyond the grass verge was a high brick wall, much of it covered in ivy. It stretched away into the distance, continuous as far as the eye could see, except for a massive arched gateway at the bend of the road. A great stone lion bestrode the gateway. As I came closer, I could see he was roaring in the rain, his lip curled, his teeth bared. I stopped and stared up at him for a moment. That was when I heard a car slowing down behind me. I didn't think twice. I pushed open the iron gate, darted through and flattened myself behind the stone pillar. I watched the car until it disappeared around the bend. To be caught would mean a caning. Four strokes, maybe six across the back of the knees. Worse, I would be back at school, back to detentions, back to Basher Beaumont. To go along the road was dangerous, too dangerous. I would try to cut across country to the station. It would be longer that way, but far safer.